This is Westminster Chapel in the heart of central London, where my grandfather, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, preached for 30 years before stepping down from the pulpit in 1968. The church held about 2,000 people, and he preached morning and evening, and on Friday evenings, going through major series such as Ephesians and Romans and Acts and the Gospel of John. After stepping down from the pulpit in 1968, he remained active through to his death in 1981. But in the early years of his retirement, 1969 to 1971, he did a series of television interviews. Alas, we don't have all of those interviews, but thanks to the permission of the broadcaster, we do have two, and they're on our YouTube site. This one is with the Welsh broadcaster, writer, and researcher, Anirin Talvin Davis. We do hope you enjoy it. Now, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, you've been about 40 years in the ministry, and before that, you were a physician. Uh, on the threshold of a very successful career. Now, what made you change course? Well, of course, that's uh, a question one can't answer in a, in a few words. It was nothing sudden or dramatic. It was a, a process which went on really for several years, but particularly for the last 18 months before I left medicine and uh, became a minister of the gospel. What do, what do you believe would would make a successful preacher. Had you those qualities? Did you feel in yourself that you had the qualities that would make a successful preacher? I really was never concerned about that. Uh, my concern was with what needed to be preached. And it was this uh, burning conviction uh, as to the message needed that uh, drove me on. I've sometimes told people of a story which will help to answer your question. Mm -hmm. How, having taken my decision, uh, to, to go into the church and to preach. Uh, someone very near to me was uh, walking with me one night and asked me the question, how do you know that you'll be able to preach? You know what you can do as a doctor, why not go on with that and uh, exercise Christian influence? How, what if you find suddenly that you can't preach? Well, I'd only tried the preaching about three times in very small places, and the only answer I could give was this. I know what I want to preach and what I think must be preached, and I have a feeling somehow that I'll be able to say it. Did anything happen during your childhood days which uh, predisposed you towards a career in the ministry? Well, the, the, the one big thing, of course, was that uh, I very nearly lost my life at the age of 10. Our home uh, somehow or other went on fire, and uh, my brother and, and myself and my father my mother was away from home. We very nearly lost our lives in the fire. We just escaped. And I, for ever since then, had some peculiar feeling and sensation that I was called to do something in this world with respect to mankind. I'll put it as generally as that. It first came to me in the form of medicine, and then, as I said, it turned to the other. Now, your father, I understand, was a, a radical. He was a follower of R.J. Campbell and a politician. Now, what, it seems to me that there's been a reaction against this in your life. He was against uh, the piety of Methodism, for instance. Now, would you say that you've reacted violently against your father's uh, views? No, far, far from it. My, my, father, my father's influence on me was one of the greatest of all yeah. because of his sincerity and his honesty. Now, what he reacted against, I've always reacted against, was the degeneration of, of true Methodism by our time, uh, the, the fire had gone, and, 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 and it, was, uh, it wasn't a, a true Puritanism, it was a false Puritanism. It, it was a, a preaching of morality without any gospel. And of course, he reacted also against the popular preaching, and I've always reacted against it, the mechanical popular preaching, what was the old Welsh hoil, which I, I think was put on generally. Now, he, was, he reacted against that, so did I, but we reacted in different ways only in this sense, that he turned to people like R.J. Campbell and the then New Theology, and I turned back to the message that was preached by the Methodist Fathers, and which I maintain is the, method, is the message of the Church throughout the centuries. Uh, it's a coincidence, perhaps, but when the booklet on uh, called The Fundamentals, I think, which gave the name Fundamentalist to that group who believe in that way, um, there's a coincidence that among them there were, in the first booklet published, Dr. Campbell Morgan, and also a man described as an eminent physician. Now, are you a, a fundamentalist? Well, I, 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 like many others, I don't like the term. I no. prefer to call myself a conservative evangelical. Uh, that is very largely because of the, uh, 
abuse of the term, I think, in the United States. Um, but I, I am a conservative evangelical, as the Dr. Campbell Morgan himself was, and as most of those men who wrote uh, the contributions to, the, to, to that symposium you're talking about were. What, what would you say the difference between yourself and the people who call themselves fundamentalists is? Well, it's, uh, one doesn't want to be offensive, but I think uh, our attitude is, is a little more intelligent. Uh, I mean, I have very little sympathy with the man who just holds up a Bible and says, I believe this from cover to cover, every comma and full stop, and all the rest of it. There's been a little bit too much of that, and, and, uh, and a refusal to, uh, to, to use one's mind and to, uh, and to recognize uh, figures of speech and so on. Uh, I think their danger has been to be literalistic in, in, in a wrong sense. Th yeah. That would be the main difference, I think, between us. Um, one thing that's impressed me about uh, Westminster Chapel, the services there when I've attended, is the, first of all, the amazing number of young people you have, and that they're also there with their Bibles in their hands. And as you preach, so they turn the leaf, leaves of the Bible and follow you. And it seems that your style is uh, different in many ways from the style of the preachers we heard in Wales in the beginning of this century. Now, what, it, what do you think is the attraction for these young people in your preaching? Well, I, I would say that uh, what appeals to them is, is the note of authority, and that isn't anything in me. It's that I am uh, an expositor of the scriptures. Uh, I, uh, I don't uh, believe it's the preacher's function to stand up and voice his own opinions and theories and ideas, but to expound and to bring out the message of the Bible. And I think it's this, and uh, one does this in as reasoning and as logical a manner as one can, to show the inevitabli inevitability of the conclusion. Mm. And I think that young people today are looking for authority. They're bewildered and they're confused, and, and they want something certain. Do you, uh, two trays in the evangelical outlook on uh, religion, uh, it seems to me uh, uh, that they, they tend to lessen the social content of the Gospels. That is, there is a lack of social content, and it seems to me a refusal to face the modern world with all its problems. And the other one is a kind of exclusivity, spiritual exclusivity, which inhibits them from uh, joining with their fellow Christians in, in action. Yes. Now, I'll, that's a long question. I'll give you time to reply to it without disturbing you. Yes, well, the trouble is you won't give me time. Uh, you <laughs> see, I, I should yes. need many hours on both the questions, yes. with which I'm very familiar, of course. This is the usual taunt. Now, with regard to your first question, I, I just dispute that completely. There is all the difference in the world between exercising a political and social influence directly and indirectly. I believe the function of the church is to do this indirectly. In other words, it is not the business of the preacher to deal with political and social issues in the pulpit. He is to preach to men and women, lay people, who are to go out into the world to do this, and never have they had a greater need of the spiritual note. The danger is, is to be materialistic in outlook. Now, I, I, and I think this has been true historically, I think I could show very easily that it is the evangelical gospel and its preaching that has had the greatest impact upon this country politically and socially. For instance, hospitals started in this way, education, the main impetus to that was the evangelical awakening of 200 years ago. It's agreed that the trades union movement came out of this, but you see, this is indirect. In other words, when you build up a man spiritually and make a true Christian of him, then he develops a social conscience, whereas these other men who are always preaching politics and about social conditions, I observe that the main effect they have is to drive their congregations away. Their congregations have become smaller and smaller, and some of them have even had to amalgamate with other churches comparatively recently, I've observed, with much interest. In other words, they have no impact at all. The main result of a man preaching politics to me is that he gets notoriety. Uh, uh, but he doesn't affect the situation at all. Now, I think this is, is, is a very vital point. For instance, you remember there was a time when there was such a thing as the nonconformist conscience, and people had to pay attention to it. 
uh, Hugh Price Hughes, a Methodist preacher, gave an address on a Sunday afternoon here in London, and Mr. Gladstone had to listen to him and take a, a particular attitude with regard to Parnell. Why? Not because Hugh Price Hughes was a preacher or a, or a political preacher, but that Mr. Gladstone knew that the, that the nonconformist conscience, which in turn leads to the nonconformist vote, would be against him if he didn't listen. So the main, if, if I want to influence political social conditions, my best plan of doing so is to produce Christian people in large numbers, and then the politicians will pay attention. They, they don't listen to what the preachers say about political and social issues. Well, um, I said I wouldn't butt in, but I yes. butt in here just to remind ourselves that your first ministry after you left the, uh, the medical profession was in Port Talbot in a working class neighborhood. Precisely. Why was that decision taken? Well, I wanted to go there because I wanted to, to, to be with people, with the, with, with the working class people in particular. It seems to me this is the great trouble in the church today, that she's not touching the working classes. I was there amongst them, and the majority of the members of our church were working class men. Uh, would would these working class men in your chapel in, in Port Talbot, would they also be enthusiastic trade unionists? Well, of then? course they were. They were great politicians. Even the secretary of the church when I went there was a great politician. But he came to see that that he, he, he needed something more. In, in other words, I saw that the great trouble in Port Talbot was, and remember when I went there, the member for that constituency was Mr. Ramsay MacDonald, and they almost worshipped him. So my great theme, in a sense, was put not your faith in princes. <laughs> and when he formed his coalition government, of course, I became a true prophet. I'd always told them not to trust men to this extent, and they were very disillusioned, and it gave me a great opportunity of preaching the gospel. In other words, if you want to deal with social conditions, you've got to do it in this indirect manner, through the preaching of the gospel. I mean, I, th I think this can be established historically quite clearly. And today, more than ever, I think we need to do this. The state has come in and provision is made for the poor and so on in a way that wasn't true even when I went into the ministry. What we need now is to remind people of the spiritual nature of man, that man cannot live by bread alone. And if ever there was a need to emphasize this, it's now. Well, uh, shall we go to the second part of the question, that is on the spiritual exclusivity? Well, it's yes. In, you were well, not a, a, a very enthusiastic ecumenist, I Well, I am, but uh, not, in the, not in the common sense of that term. I, I'm a great believer in church unity. I think uh, that these divisions are sinful. What but, grounds, what grounds uh, are well, there for this church unity that you want? Well, the New Testament teaches this, our Lord's high priestly uh, prayer, that they all might be one and that the world might know uh, we are meant to be one and to present this common message to the world. But there is all the difference in the world between a true spiritual, biblical New Testament unity and a mere amalgamation of people who call themselves Christian and who disagree violently with one another with regard to the very essentials of the gospel. That's my criticism of the ecumenical movement. For instance, what would the, what would the public think if two men appeared on a political platform together, maintaining that they were standing for the same things, one of them an extreme socialist and the other a died in the wool Tory? The, the world would ridicule. Well, now, that's the Would it really? Th would it? I mean, isn't this possible? We, we see these... Uh variations within the Christian church. Is it really, must we really have a one policy, one viewpoint well, but the, arising the, from the Christian faith? Is well, it? Uh, well, just a minute, let me put it like this to you. I think that there, there, there are certain broad distinctions, and I would say that the one big dividing line is what I would call evangelical or non-evangelical, or if you like, evangelical and more Catholic. Uh, or, again, I'll put it in this way, men who believe in, uh, in definitions of the faith and are opposed to any vagueness or uncertainty, and those who take perhaps uh, a more priestly view or, uh, or put it more in terms of some vague general spirit of brotherhood and friendship and concern about humanity. Yeah, but one, one is concerned that by this kind of division that you are making, that you are really dividing the sheep and the goats, as it were, and that you are cutting out from your ecumenism at least at least 
half the Christian church. Well, of, yes, of course, but you see the Bible talks uh, a great deal about this, about the remnant. Uh, the, the Bible has a great deal to say about the remnant, and we, we're not concerned about figures. Luther, you see, but it at one point... it isn't a remnant within the church, is it? Well, we're, no. The church the, is the remnant. No, no, not, not at all. You have a remnant within the church, as you had a remnant in Israel, which was the church in the Old Testament. And Martin Luther, at one point, stood absolutely alone. You, you don't decide these matters in terms of figures. It's a question of your view of the truth. And I believe that the people outside are utterly confused when they see on the television or hear on the radio uh, men both claiming to be Christians and standing for the same thing, but violently and, and totally disagreeing from one another with regard to the very content of the gospel. Well, uh, then it comes an interpretation of the, of go of the gospels. Precisely. And what, what is your uh, source of authority for uh, the statements you make, the deductions you make from the gospel? Well, you see, I, I'm a typical and traditional Protestant. My source of authority is, is the Bible itself. Then you're going to ask me, I know immediately, but that's your interpretation. Well, of course, but one is guided in this and one checks one's interpretation by what has been taught throughout the centuries, uh, by the fathers, the patristic fathers, and, and by the reformers, uh, and, and by others. In other words, well, uh, the Apostle John uh, tells us that uh, we have an unction from the Holy One and we know all things, he says. In other words, the Holy Spirit is in us and therefore we all ought to be capable of interpreting the Scriptures. But uh, if we're truly Christian, we'll be humble and modest and we'll check our interpretation. But this does mean that there must be some consensus somewhere. Well, there and is. if you cut, ha cut out half the church, there's hardly going to be any consensus, except within a sect within the well, church. Well, you've got a consensus in the other half. Yes, but uh, but they must come together, surely. Well, why? I mean, in other words, uh, you were suggesting, obviously, that the Protestant Reformation was a tragedy. No, I'm not suggesting anything. Well, but kind. there was a division. But, but but there was a division. But there was, there were the Protestant Reformation wasn't all right. Now, I there agree. Were, neither was the thing that they reacted against all right. All but wrong, you mean? All wrong, yes, I mean. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, but. There must come a time, surely, in the uh, Christian, in the history of the Christian Church, when we must envisage the Church coming together again. All no, these sections. No, of the church. I don't believe you will ever have a perfect Church, and and this mechanical attempt today to 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 produce uh, one world Church is, is to me something that's quite impossible. Uh, the church will never be perfect, even if you had the evangelical church that I'm looking forward to throughout the world, where there is a general consensus of opinion and agreement concerning the doctrines we hold to and stand for. That would not be a perfect church by yeah. any means. But there isn't a consensus within the evangelical movement. There are there? minor differences, no. minor differences. Major but differences. No, I'll, not, I'll no, I'll no. I, I will not grant that there are major differences. We are agreed about the content of the gospel. We, we disagree at certain points in the application of what we believe in common. Uh, that I, I, I really must contend for that amongst conservative evangelicals. And uh, as I, uh, you said, I, I, I preach in various parts of the world. I find this, wherever I, I've been five months in America this year, I found it there. There well, is this. We've come to yes. the near the end of our time, and I want to give you the last word. And I'd like to ask you this question. What do you think the church needs above all else today? Well, I think I've really been answering the question the whole time, haven't I? She yes, needs well. to be absolutely certain about her message. We need to get back to the position of Paul when he went to Corinth. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. We mustn't be trying to preach philosophy or politics or things of that kind. We must go back to this New Testament message and realize on top of that that without the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit, even the preaching of that message will be in vain. That is what I believe is absolutely essential today. As Paul puts it in writing to the Thessalonians, our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and with much assurance. That's the essential.